you mentioned that when you do the exosomes, there's a possibility of doing more focused treatments. What's a focused treatment like? Well, if, uh, if, if you, for example, had an old knee injury and you tore your meniscus, maybe you had surgery on it years ago and uh, it still maybe catches or gives you pain walking up and down the stairs, uh, we would do an MRI if that was a residual problem, even after an IV approach. And we can, we can treat that by um, most uh, efficaciously going into the bone above and below with an injection of exosomes. We do that at the surgery center under sedation because it's in the bone. And yeah. um, there are some wonderful studies uh, in the French literature um, uh, because they don't have as many uh, you know, regulatory issues as we do. Yeah. And 15-year-plus uh, follow-up uh, where the bone injections uh, caused 80 to 85% of patients to be able to avoid a knee replacement who were told they needed one before they joined the study 15 years earlier. So mm -hmm. there, there, there's a, our body can heal. We have the programming, we have the genetics. Not unlike a salamander can regrow its tail or a starfish can regrow uh, an arm. Our genes for that turn off, but they can be partially reactivated in, in, in small ways and regenerating cartilage as well. When you inject the exosomes into the bone, you're not doing stem cells, you're doing exosomes into the bone. Well, we're doing exosomes that activate your sleepy stem cells okay. in the bone marrow, which is yeah, where I most of our... it's in the marrow. It's in the marrow. That's, mm -hmm. where the, the, that's where the health of a joint comes from. The cart, most of the cartilage we have is kind of biological rubber. There's not, not a lot of cells. There's not a lot of metabolism or activity. There's some. But, but if you want to give, for example, the spine, you want to give a disc some health. It gets its nutrients and blood flow from the bone above and below, just at the edge, called the subchondral bone. And that's the target. And we know this is the issue because if you look at MRI scans of patients with degenerating discs, loss of disc height, loss of the biological rubber, mm -hmm. um, we see bone marrow inflammation above and below. And those are called modic changes, named for Dr. Michael Modic out of the Cleveland Clinic, who identified them when MRI became uh, new. So we're, that's our target. We wanna treat those inflamed bone marrow areas and activate your own stem cells into a more youthful state, causing the, the, the deposition of new cartilage and new chondrocytes and new cells that, that, that can enhance, improve, and regenerate the, the mechanical structure that's causing pain. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. You are a neurological surgeon, and you also are a spine doctor, because those are obviously very attached to each other, parts of our body. Um, you got into this, as I understand it, because you felt like you could do less surgery and help people pr pr repair from the inside out with these new technologies. How have customers taken to these new therapies? Are you finding that people are willing to not do surgery and try these new capabilities? Uh, I, I say we have a lot of interest. Uh, you know, the main problem is that health insurance does not cover this. Yeah. Uh, uh, this does step on the toes of big pharma. It does step on the toes of large companies that make surgical products like screws and rods and things. Mm -hmm. So my whole career has been one of trying to do, you know, less surgery and only doing it as the last option. And adding this to our toolbox, adding regenerative medicine to our toolbox, it just furthers that goal, uh, accelerates it significantly. So I also enjoy this more because we can really, really help people. You know, a, a, a spinal fusion, for example, can, can really help, but it's not itself a cure. Yeah. It's a remodel of the spine and it's significant and ca can cause problems above and below and other spots. Regenerative medicine is a whole different approach that we've been but our bodies have been able to do this for a long time. I'm just helping our bodies do it. If money were no object, what are the five best use cases for using regenerative therapies? And in the case of exosomes versus stem cells, who can you help the most? Well, I think uh, the, the low-hanging fruit, if you will, are people with, with joint problems, uh, old knee injuries, uh, what's called osteoarthritis, uh, even separate from the disease of rheumatoid arthritis. This is this is just the degeneration of the joints uh, that we get with chronic use, chronic abuse of the joints, uh, age, other inflammatory 
factors, diet, lifestyle, et cetera. We could go on for quite a while talking about that. So uh, people with, with trying to avoid joint replacement. So that's the first group. I'll call it the, the joints. Um, secondly, the autoimmune group. Uh, we have people with um, you know, all kinds of autoimmune conditions, whether it's a thyroid problem or a neurological problem or people that are affected with Lyme's disease. Uh, this group is well known to respond to what we'll call you know, broadly anti-inflammatory treatment through regenerative medicine. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say the third group is the group that's feeling the effect of age significantly. And this would be called the, you know, the, the senescent group. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've got people that are borderline having, you know, neurologic issues, cognitive decline, you know, uh, can't remember where they put their keys, uh, from that, from, from lack of energy, things like this. Uh, I want to take those patients and very easily give them, you know, a, a, a biological reset to a, to a younger state. And those, those are people that might need or want periodic IV treatments. Uh, let's see, that's three groups. Yeah. Uh, the fourth group is there, there are cosmetic uses. Um, that's, that's not the main thrust of our practice at this time, although we do, we have treated some people with uh, thinning hair. Um, you know, you, we can't take a bald person to regrow hair yeah. at, through exosomes yet. Um, someday there may be designer exosomes for that purpose, but we do, we do uh, inject scalp for that purpose. And, and then fifth, uh, you know, uh, sexual health, um, O shots and P shots. Yeah. Are you doing O shots and P shots? Um, we we haven't done O shots and P shots, uh, but we we You're getting want into to. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, are you open to talking about price ranges for the various types of things that you do? Generally speaking, um, you know, to to have an IV exosome uh, approach here uh, that runs just under four thousand um, dollars, and and it's up from there. You know, if we, if we're doing uh, multiple joints in the surgery center with the time and the anesthesiologist and everything, that you know, it could be upwards of uh, you know twelve thousand plus. Uh, we have you know the ability to do many things while we're in the surgery center uh, because you're under sedation. So yeah. we do have people that come in with multiple joint issues at the same time. And uh, that, that, you know, it, 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 it's a economy of scale. We can do more doses, really it's, it's dose based. Our biggest cost is, is the product, yeah. What kinds of questions should a consumer who's interested in getting exosome IVs be asking their practitioner? There are obviously different companies offering exosomes. I mean, is it kind of like probiotics? How many billion CFUs there are, or you know, how how do you how are you a wise consumer? I'm a consumer too, and I have the same question. So it's a it's a great set of questions. Um, so so first and foremost, um, all we have to go on is is numbers right now. But you want to make sure your exosomes come from a source that's a quality lab, and the labs are uh, meet all the regulatory. Uh, criteria. There are FDA criteria for labs, how they obtain and produce, screen the patients or the, or the donors, you know, um, so that kind of thing. That's important to me. Uh, second is is count. Uh, you know, so it is like probiotics. In, in a way. I mean, there, there are products on the market for, for, for 10 billion particles of exosomes, all the way up to 400, you know, and if we're going to do it, we should do it at the 400 level if we can most of the times. So I tend to do that. I tend to use the higher dose products. Um, by dose, I mean count. Now, one could say, well, we don't know what's in the, the exosomes. We don't know the, the strength and the effect. And we're not, it's gonna be individual. And that's why the labs we work with choose healthy young mothers who are delivering healthy babies who are screened. They don't have any substance use. They don't have any diseases and had all their vaccinations and everything. These are, these are the healthiest, but you know, there's always individual variation in, in the concentration of growth factors in the exosomes and the RNAs. And we're not at a point where we can measure that. There's no test for that at this point. We're, companies are working on that. Okay. There are multiple and growing numbers of suppliers of biologics, stem cells, exosomes, um, umbilical cord tissues, things like this uh, in the US. And, and these, are, these are domestic products. Uh, we, we can get international products, I just haven't done that. So um, I want to go with a reputable source that, that delivers routinely what we need and, 
and we, we, we ask our patients, are we getting benefits? I, I'm a patient too, so um, I, I feel comfortable with the product I've had consistency with. When you get exosomes and you get them ready for IVs, what, what do the exosomes look like? Are they just in a little vial? Are they in a little... How do they come? We will show you. Okay. We will take some, some video of it, but uh, uh, we, we have a very special minus 30 freezer to store them, uh, which is okay, so much yeah. colder than a regular freezer. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't apparently need to be that way, but we, we do it that way, just keep them extra fresh. They get shipped on dry ice overnight. Uh, they come in very small vials. Each has a, a, um, a code number that uh, can be tracked back to the donor. Um, and uh, it's, we, we have a one cc in a very small vial. You will see it. We, we thaw it out with our hands and deliver it fresh as if it's fresh from the womb. And do you just put it in a saline bag? Is it an IV in a saline we bag do. type of thing? And, and, it, and you see right over here? Yeah. Uh, this, isn't for your, this isn't for your coat. <laughs> this is for the IV bag. <laughs> That's so, it's so fast and easy. It really is. Mm -hmm. So how many, how many times have you done exosome IVs now? I think I'm five, I think I'm five or six times into it. No. Was there a time? Was there a moment in time when you realized, okay, I've I've kind of begun to hit some critical mass of regenerative appreciation, or did you feel like it was fairly linear, like you just kept getting mm -hmm. better and better and better over time? No, I think I think I I have a I I feel great, and then I feel like I need one, and I have those two bounds, and I. I, I, I probably am riding that sine wave, you know, and um, there's, it's hard to measure, you know, the internal um, cellular activity. Yeah. So what we're, we're starting to do when we're working on putting together study is, is doing one of the, the biological age tests. Yeah. And doing uh, either one treatment or treatment over time mm -hmm. and then repeating the biological age test to see if there is a, a marker of benefit from you know the the cellular markers of age, whether it's a, a you know methylated DNA test yeah. or um, you know glycated proteins and right. things like that. So we're looking at that right now because we do want to track it. We do want to be able to publish it and uh, and look and, and and have a measure besides how we feel. So um, the methylated versus glycation testing for biological versus chronological age. What are the pros and cons of those two things? Do you think that there are some people, like maybe people who are, you know, have like a lot of diabetes, pre-diabetic in their family versus people who, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. How are you looking at the two biological age tests? And I think you should explain biological age versus chronological age so that people have a level set of that, because that's a fairly new concept. Uh, fantastic. Let's start with defining the terms, because yeah. then we're, we're talking the same language. Okay. But um, when we talk about age generally, and uh, you know, we always have since we were old enough to say, how old are you, right? Yeah. I'm three and a half. So <laughs> when we talk about age, we're talking about a calendar. We're talking about a clock. How many years have you been on the planet? Um, how, you know, what time is it? That's chronological age, chrono meaning time or, or on the clock. However, if you, if you take a look at two 80-year-olds, one 80 year old might be youthful and active and riding the bike every day and playing golf and, and uh, social and, and, and everything. And one 80 year old might be in a nursing home lying in a bed all day. And those two people are chronologically the same age. They, were, they have the same born on date, right? So why are they so different? It's because something's different in their cells, in their biology or physiology. So that People call that biological age. I think physiological age makes more sense. But what we're talking about is cellular programming and cellular metabolism over time. And the youthful 80-year-old has maintained that, whether it's genetic or lifestyle. We'll come back to that in just a moment. And, and the older appearing and behaving one has accumulated more inflammation, whether it's hard living or exposure to toxins, smoking, or diet, what have you, um, we, we accumulate those changes and the more, over, more on the chronological age we accumulate those changes, the more effect on the physiologic age. So you can prevent that physiologic aging to some component and stay physiologically younger while you're chronologically older. And that's the goal here, right, is be the most youthful 80 year old you can be right or right. say you look so young you know susan how do you look so young how do you feel so young how do you have so much energy because you work at it you, yeah. you 
anti-aging is a is a specialty of medicine, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it, there's some discussion of whether or not aging is a disease. I think that's just silliness. You know, it's it's rhetoric. It it doesn't matter. It's we we will all age. We will all have a chronic. We will accumulate experiences. We will accumulate energy. We will accumulate all kinds of things, and our cells accumulate junk, and some of those cells die off or become senescent and, and gum up the works. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really need to work uh, to, to keep ourselves younger. And the measure of that are these biological age tests. Mm -hmm. And there are different measures. Uh, how, how, how messed up is your DNA? How does it affect your telomeres, the ends of the DNA? Mm -hmm. How many methylation changes do you have in your DNA? How many glycated proteins are circulating? So these are all different measures. The, the tests generally correlate well, mm -hmm. meaning one test isn't specifically better than the other test. test. Um, this has been looked at and very recently published. So it, I don't know that I have a favorite yet. Mm -hmm. So I think you do the easy, most affordable one and, and you track it. Yeah, you're getting a data point. You're getting a, yeah. yeah. And, and so you can follow the trend at least. Yeah. And, and, and you're compared to a group of thousands of others. So, so there's some idea of, of chronologic age and physiologic age comparatively. Right, it's a cohort. It's exactly it's you against cohort. your cohort. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then it turns out that most people believe that our genetics are responsible for about twenty percent of this. Right. So epigen epigenetics. Epigenetics is the eighty percent. Meaning, yeah. we all have the same DNA we were born with. Why is it not working like when we were twelve years old? And the reason is, um, what DNA is actively being used to make proteins and to make things in the cell? depends on how we influence it with diet and exercise and rest and breathing and sleep and, and supplementation because we don't get it through our diet, things like that. And that's way we circle back to regenerative medicine. It's probably the most uh, powerful way to, to reprogram, even if it's temporary, the cells of our body to behave, program and act more youthfully, more, more anti-inflammatorily. Mm -hmm.